Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. My name is Kelsey Prehoda, and I am the Great Lakes Transportation Extension Educator with Minnesota Sea Grant. Minnesota Sea Grant is the lead organization for the Hazardous Material Transport Outreach Network, or HAZMATON. Our network is a binational collaborative of specialists from the Great Lakes, Lake Champlain, Hudson River, and St. Lawrence River regions focused on reducing risks associated with multiple modes of hazardous material transportation. The collaborative is committed to dissemination of accurate, neutral, and data-driven information through education, outreach, and relationship building in order to improve public safety, the region's economy, and environmental stewardship of our water resources. Is. To that end, we are pleased to bring you the July installment of our 2022 summer webinar series. And I'm going to have one of my colleagues launch a poll that is basically for our benefit to see um, how you've heard about the webinar series to date. Um, so the webinar series, our July webinar, um, is uh, these webinars are taking place monthly, by the way, um, through September. And today's webinar is entitled Tribal Treaty Rights and Energy Infrastructure. And this webinar will describe tribal treaty law and treaty rights, their role in protecting natural resources and the assertion of those rights by Native American and First Nations tribes as regulatory components to energy infrastructure projects. So last month, we learned about the movement of crude oil and its refined products from multiple perspectives, including logistics, the regional energy economy, and potential environmental and social impacts. And that webinar was recorded and has been posted to Hazmaton's webinar webpage, which was just shared in the chat. Um, the next webinar in our series will take place in mid to late August. And more information and registration for that will be available soon at the same web page that was just posted in the chat. Before we get started, I have just a few logistics to share with everyone. Uh, first, this webinar is being recorded. The recording with closed captions will be made publicly available on Minnesota Sea Grants YouTube page and also the Hazardous Material Transport Outreach Network's webinar webpage. We invite you to submit questions, comments, or technical challenges at any time via the question and answer box in your Zoom toolbar. We will be collecting those for the question and answer session that will take place following the presentation. And so with that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Kekek Stark is an assistant professor of law co-director of the Indian Law Program, co-director of the Marjorie Hunter Brown Indian Law Clinic, and co-director of the American Indian Governance and Policy Institute at the Alexander Blewett III School of Law at the University of Montana. Professor Stark came to Montana by way of the University of Minnesota Duluth, which is where I'm physically located, where he was an assistant professor with the American Indian Studies Department. He is a practitioner of Indigenous law and has taught courses in federal Indian law, natural resources, tribal government, tribal sovereignty, and treaty rights. Professor Stark is also a former president of the Minnesota American Indian Bar Association, a Bush Foundation Leadership Fellow, and an alumnus of Hamlin University School of Law. He served as a policy analyst in the Division of Intergovernmental Affairs for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, as a policy analyst for the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Tribe of Chippewa Indians, and as the Attorney General for the Lacoudere Band of Lake Superior Tribe of Chippewa Indians. Professor Stark's research interests include the Anishinaabe Legal Order, Diplomacy, Natural Resources, and Treaty Rights. Professor Stark is a member of the Bishu clan and is a Turtle Mountain Ojibwe. Professor Stark, thank you for being here and take it away. All right. Well, Buju, Kekekinigo, Benesin, Guime, Bishu, and Dode, and the Kanak, Juin, and Dune, Dubai. Human Wayne, the Mayano Mano Group, Kagi Kaduyan, Onishinabe, and Alcona Gaywin. So, I'm here going to talk a little bit about tribal treaty rights, energy infrastructure, and how that all plays out in some of the process. So, 
as we begin, and we want to think about how we protect our tribal resources. So at the core, whether it be the land back movement, tribal co-management movement, or TEK use of traditional or tribal knowledge and wisdom, those are all rooted in the desire to ensure that indigenous peoples can reconnect and restore their relationships with their homelands and reinvigorate their vital historical culture and other meaningful connections to their land. And that includes the plants, resources, and all the things that are taken or derived from the land. So here's a little map of some of the historic Aboriginal territories. So you can see how they overlap. Specifically, we're going to focus a lot on the Great Lakes region, which is Anishinaabe territory, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, Menominee, Anishinaabe territory. So when we begin to think about tribal treaty rights and what those rights are and what they entail, they stem from our Aboriginal rights and Aboriginal title, which is really based upon our geographical identity the geographical place plus our identity established the tribe sovereignty and their connection and Aboriginal title. And legally it's defined as the interest Indians possess as occupants of their land based upon their original inhabitants by virtue of possession and inherent tribal sovereignty. And their identity is where their tribal sovereignty stems from through their name, their clan, their connection, creation story, which provides that plus their occupancy is the basis for their Aboriginal rights. So a lot of times when we think of Aboriginal rights, they've also been defined as um, usual rights of occupancy. Um, and they obviously include the right to hunt, fish, and gather. That was first held in Shoshone, the United States, and just in Minnesota. And when we think of Aboriginal rights, they're derived from ancestral use, the use of the territory for traditional purposes, cultural expression. It includes the right to land and water, the right to practice customs, traditions, religion, the right to retain languages, cultures, self-government. So again, when we think of all the bundle of sticks that are Aboriginal rights, a lot of times we just think about hunting, fish, and gathering, but it's all those other aspects of sovereignty that are entailed in those rights that were also reserved. And when we think about reserved rights, we have the reserved rights doctrine, which was first held in both Winters and Winans. Um, and it says treaty solidified Indian rights, because it wasn't a grant of rights to the Indians, but a grant of rights from them. So they reserved all those rights that they otherwise did not give away. So that's what the reserved rights doctrine. So all those bundle of Aboriginal rights, self-government, hunting, fishing, gathering, language, religion, culture was all reserved pursuant to the treaty. So here's a map of the traditional territories that were judicially recognized. So this is part of the Indian land claims process. So again, you see, the Chippewa or Ojibwe territory in the Upper Great Lakes extends all the way uh, into Northern North Dakota and part of Montana as part of the Little Shell, all the way to Michigan. And then you get the Canadian side, which includes the other aspect of Anishinaabe territory. So the reserved rights to hunt, fish, and gather are, are the means by which tribes maintain their traditional cultural practices, use natural resources for spiritual, ceremonial, cultural subsistence and commercial purposes. And that comes with the idea of land ownership. And it was a complex system of use rights and obligations. So a lot of times when we think of tribal understanding of land ownership and their rights and responsibilities to, ter to the territory, a lot of times we get the misconception that tribes didn't have ideas of ownership or their responsibilities to land, and that wasn't true. Their understandings of their land was different, and it was about obligations and responsibilities more than I own and have dominion over those that land. And that was expressed in the 1863 treaty with Red Lake and Turtle Mountain 
they called it the Old Crossing Treaty, where Alexander Ramsey wanted to say, like, oh, you should see the Red River Valley because tribes don't believe and you don't understand that you own the land. So it's okay if you give it to us. And they're like, no, I know that you came from across that big body of water. And I know that I was created and placed here. This land belongs to me. I have responsibilities for this land. And so the treaty journal really expresses that understanding um, that that ownership was different, but there were contexts to how they understood their, their resources and their responsibility to their resources. <clears throat> so when we think of how treaties were expressed their rights, so in the 1842 treaty, they expressed Indians stipulate to the right of hunting on the ceded territory with the other usual privileges of occupancy. So again, that, that's a phrase synonymous with that, all Aboriginal rights. Sometimes they're called customary rights, use of rectory rights, usual rights of occupancy, permissive occupancy. So that language triggers that all Aboriginal rights were reserved. You see some of the other language in the 37 Treaty, privilege of hunting, fishing, gathering the wild rice on the rivers and lakes is guaranteed, 42 just talked about 1854, such as in reside in the territory shall be right to hunt fish there. So all those trigger that idea that all those bundles of Aboriginal rights were preserved. The next little principles the Indian canons of treaty construction. So this was first done in Jones v. Neham, which was again a Red Lake case, it was further expressed in the Malax case, um, also Menominee case. But they say ambiguous expressions must be resolved in favor of the Indians. Indians must, Indian treaties must be interpreted as the Indians understood them, and they must be liberally construed in favor of the Indians. So these are the canons. So when we think about what those expressions mean, they're supposed to be held under how the Indians understood them and in favor of the Indians. And the idea that because the treaty was written in English, that it's really that tribal understanding that's supposed to play out. So when we think of the basis of our treaty rights based upon those Indian canons, we think of our first treaty with the universe. And some call it the great law of nature, but our first treaty of which all additional treaties were then negotiated under that guise or that lens or that understanding was ever supposed to respect all things, respect all that we were given. So we're thinking of our food, the animals, the trees to use. And part of our clan story and our, a number of our traditional stories talk about how the animals came forward to provide for us out of love for the Anishinaabe, we were having a hard time. They said they would provide for us, they would pity us. And therefore, that established that relationship and our responsibility to then acknowledge them and use them in a respectful way. So when we entered into the further treaties or additional treaty, it was under this guise of our responsibilities to the land and our territory, which we implemented those provisions. So based upon that first treaty, the Ojibwe regard land as a gift from the creator to the people and the interrelationship upon and the dependence with the earth. So again, Indians were the last created and therefore the least necessary, you know, like the plants were here, then they put the animals here and the and Last of all was you know, fish and the flyers, and then humans were created as Anishinaabe. And we depend on all aspects of creation and the rest. You know, if we went away, they could still survive. So it's part of that relationship. Um, and we're dependent upon all them, and it's out of respect and their love for us that we can still reside here and live here. So part of our responsibilities upholding that relationship. And also acknowledging that, you know, the spiritual aspect that 
you know, with creation, the spirit is in all of creation, and therefore it is the basis of all we do it has to be recognized from a traditional and cultural capacity. So when we think of traditional law, we call it gete nakone gaiwen. It's the idea that the creator bestow cultural distinctiveness or the idea of sovereignty upon the Ojibwe people. And as long as we practice our ancestral ways, acknowledge our homelands, which then affirms our Aboriginal rights or inherent sovereign rights. Through the oral tradition, then we're upholding our responsibilities in that first treaty as expressed through traditional law and custom. So that's how most of our systems of management, implementation, regulation are all based upon this concept of traditional law and upholding those responsibilities to the land. So when we think of the land, we call it Gidekiminan, which is our, our collective mother earth. And we lived according to the circle of the seasons. Um, you know, tribes, villages move from place to place, depending upon the harvest activities. So in the spring, they would harvest fish with the spawning of the walleyes, gather maple sugar. In the summer, they would gather plants, birch bark, medicines. In the fall, harvest wild rice, hunting, harvesting waterfall. In the winter, they would fish through the ice trap. So those are some of the activities based upon when we think of the implementation of treaty rights based upon our relationship with Gidekimana. So when we think of Indian law, we call Anishinaabe Atizu Kanana Konegewin, or traditional Indian teachings that are thought about as law. So when we bring the idea of that traditional law, Gete Nakonegewin forward, so our tribal tradition and custom serve as our customary or common law today. So customary law allows our modern tribal justice systems our tribal regulatory systems to be in accordance with tribal society as shown to our traditions, the use of our customary law then reinforces those traditions. And so by implementing our tradition and customs through traditional law, we're preserving our culture and we're maintaining it and perpetuating it into the future. So from that, our customs and traditions are fundamental and basic to Indian life and society and are regarded as a higher law. So when we implement and think about tribal customary law, it adds a cultural substance to our tribal regulatory framework. So again, we're not just operating and regulating based upon maybe how the state of Minnesota does it or the state of Wisconsin or the state of Michigan, but it's uniquely tribal because we, it brings in that customary aspect, that cultural and traditional aspect, of how the tribes regulate the resource in their territory. So the use of customary law enables dialogue. So it's also important to think about and understand that when we, we talk about teachings and traditions that are not static, they're not stagnant, they don't get confined into a box about this is what we thought were our rules in 1820, but that it can evolve our understanding with the land, use of methods of harvest can evolve, and they still have to be culturally appropriate and culturally responsive, but it allows in the ability to engage and discuss what does that teaching mean to me? What does that teaching mean to my children, to their peers? And how do they maintain that important aspect of meaning? You know, how does it maintain relevance to modern society? So as we implement customary law, it allows for us to discuss what it means today, how we're implementing, how has it evolved, and how is it the same and all those aspects. So it's another 
aspect of engaging in culture and tradition in a meaningful way, getting people to not only understand it, engage it, but also um, implement those aspects of customer allowance. So when we think of TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, some call it traditional environmental knowledge, Customary law forms the basis of a lot of that GEK, the culture and philosophy is incorporated along with science. Sometimes the TKA, TEK itself is science, and sometimes it can be, you know, interweaved together to have a full understanding of how we should manage a resource. So we can bring in some of a scientific study, maybe uh, harvest survey or population survey and add that into what the cultural principles say to say here's our quota for the season and how it's going to be implemented so it's the ability to incorporate both modern science and traditional science and that also allows us to implement and embody our relationship with the res and responsibilities to our territory so by thinking of those tribal customary law being embedded through TEK, it's upholding that first treaty with the universe with creation. So when we think of the Malax case or the LCO case, what we call the Voight decision. So in LCO v. Wisconsin, they said the tribes have the right to continue to hunt, fish, and gather in all parts of the ceded territory, again, for subsistence, economic, cultural, spiritual, and medicinal needs. So it's not only for subsistence needs or cultural needs, but they could also have economic. So the idea of commercial harvest is part of the what was reserved in the treaty. And also the cases recognized that they exploited very, pretty much every natural resource within the ceded territories or within their traditional territory. And so um, the cases lay out like a whole list of all the species that were harvested. But basically the court said, they basically harvested everything, which means they have the ability or reserve the right to harvest pretty much everything found within the territory. And it was also adopted in the Mille Lacs case on the Minnesota side as well as the Fond du Lac v. Carlson, that basically um, all of the resources that were present within the treaty territory was reserved and therefore open for harvest. So because of that, because you had a wide range of resources, it's hard to manage according to a single resource. So what the tribes have begun to do is manage according, manage the ecosystems that support a wide range of resources. So by managing the ecosystem to make sure the ecosystem is flourishing and that all those resources within it can sustain itself and be present, then you're getting your best bang for the buck to make sure that all those resources that you have available for harvest are protected. Also, it allows for some traditional or cultural properties or cultural resources or medicinal plants or medicinal aspects that the tribes want to remain private. They don't have to say, hey, I'm protecting this resource, which is protected, um, but I'm managing this ecosystem, which may contain that resource. So it's another way to, to protect information that may be of cultural importance and still maintaining and managing the territory accordingly without saying specifically this traditional resource is present here and we're managing it in this way. Um, so when we have environmental issues that impact those ecosystems, then they have the ability to address the concerns on like ecosystem-wide basis rather than a specific species basis. So again, this is part of the idea of for medicinal 
products, you're managing the ecosystems that support that those medicinal products. So the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission was formed to assist the tribes in the implementation of their treaty rights. So it's an intertribal agency um, and it manages the resource on behalf of the tribes and with the tribes for the implementation of <laughs> tribal harvest, tribal management, tribal regulation. And so part of Glyphwick's mission is to protect the ecosystems in recognition that fish, wildlife, and plants cannot survive in an in abundance in an environment that has been degraded. That's part of Glyphwick's mission. So you see the 11 tribes are part of the commission that expand in Minnesota, Northern Wisconsin, Michigan, both the UP and the part of the upper lower peninsula. Then you also have the 1854 Treaty Authority in the Arrowhead of Minnesota. You now have the 1855 Treaty Authority. Then you also have Cora, which also covered the 1836 Treaty Territory, some of the intertribals that managed the treaty resources in the territory. So when we think about protecting the habitat and environment, so the treaty has been interpreted to say that part of the existence of the treaty right is the existence of the ability to protect the habitats and ecosystems that are made up or encompass those treaty areas. So um, in an off-reservation context, tribes are not the regulators or permit issuers when proposals are being developed. So if we're talking energy infrastructure, it's not necessarily the tribes that are issuing the permits unless it crosses tribal lands specifically, but they do have a role in off-reservation permits. On reservation, they actually have a heightened role because it's crossing their land. Um, but the existence of the treaty right places constraints on the management authority. So if the state is issuing a permit, they're constrained by the existence of the treaty right to make sure the habitat and environmental aspects are maintained and protected. So what does that mean? It's kind of being interpreted as following some of the Culver's case in U.S. v. Washington and strengthened because the courts recognize that there is a habitat component to the treaty right. But specifically in the Great Lakes, the wild rice and wild plant stipulation in the LCO case say they, may, they must consult. So state must consult before the issuance of any permit that would affect the abundance of habitat of the abundance of wild rice or wild plant. So, there is the need to consult specifically for any permit that's issued. Also tribes hold seats on management committees for a number of species, small game fish, deer. In the Minnesota context, they actually have the wild plant and wildlife committee and then they have the treaty fish committee that covers all those ecosystem-based resources. So, when we think of treaty obligations and the, the ability to trigger consultation, you also have federal executive orders, policies. We also need to understand capacity. So the tribal capacity to have the time to consult on all these permits, all these issues, but also the ability to build capacity to fully understand the issues. So capacity is a is an important aspect and everybody needs to support the tribe's abilities to develop uh, their capacity to further manage their resources and regulate their resources. So when we think of effective consultation, part of it is the nature of the rights. So what is it that is, an, is effective? What is it that's you know, actually being proposed? How would the action impact those rights? And then 
understand the tribal view. So when we think of tribal customary law, traditional law, that's coming forward and that's being expressed, well, how does that impact that potential action? We also have interactions with federal agencies. Obviously, we talked about a number of executive orders that all require consultation, but specifically we have the Army Corps with 404 permits and the Clean Water Act. We also have NIPTES permits as part of the EPA. Um, also, tribes can be cooperating agencies in areas of a special expertise so they can intervene as cooperating agencies if there's an EIS being developed for a project or an infrastructure project. So that's some of the ways tribes have become involved to express part of their management responsibility. So not only is the feds subject to the consultation requirement, but also the state. Also, it's important in those interactions that we have common understandings about how the tribes view their natural resources. So again, those cultural and traditional aspects, those ties between the resources and culture, understand the scientific technical aspects of a proposal, and then the specific impacts on the resources that the tribes rely upon. So when thinking about consultation and how to interact, these are some important information that needs to be shared. Um, again, treaties create relationships. So when we think about the need to con consult, but some actually argue about the need to consent. Um, so the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has a call for that it's even above consultation. There's a need to get tribal consent if you're going to implement projects across tribal territories, traditional territories, which include ceded territories or treaty territories. So part of the idea is that when tribes entered the treaty with the United States, they made relatives with the Americans because they said, you can also live in our territories and we'll share some of these resources. So a lot of times we say the treaty right also granted states and state citizens a share of their right because with the 50-50 allocation, you know, the state and state, your normal state citizens reserve part of that right. But with that, there was the understanding that they would live according to the teachings of the land upon which they occupy. So part of that was bringing them into that tribal context, that tribal understanding, and that. So when we think about the ability for tribes to regulate, and part of that trigger for regulating non-tribal activities, consensual relationships. And so the treaty itself provided that consent to say, hey, any activity within our territory, we consented to tribal regulation because we agreed to be held by those principles of tribal law. Um, again, habitat protection is an indispensable component of the treaty, right? So again, you have the Culver's case we talked about where they upheld that culvert replacements, preventing fish access to usual and custom fishing grounds needed to, to be, you know, those activities had to be mitigated because they were preventing the ability to, one, tribes harvest and the actual reducing the population, so they had to fix it. The Northwest Sea Farms, they denied a permit for salmon pens because it affected usual and custom fishing grounds. We also had um, Army Corps denied a permit for an expansion of a marina in Grand Portage Bay because they said the proposal was not in the public interest. Focusing on impacts of the bay, including in adverse impacts on the fishery and aquatic resources and spiritual cultural impacts on the tribe. Also, nationwide general permits under the Clean Water Act contain a standard condition prohibiting activity with that would impair a reserved treaty right, including reserved water rights and treaty fishing and hunting rights. 
So some those are some of the additional constraint, con constraints. In the case of state permits, again, the court said that the management options of the state are narrowed significantly by the existence of the treaty, right? That was in LCO 6. State actions are subject to judicial review. Judicial review, that was in the Malax case. So again, the courts recognize the existence of protecting the habitat and the constraint on state regulatory authority and how some of that tribal regu regulatory authority applies. Um, Wisconsin has denied applications for chemical chemical control of aquatic nuisance species if they impact the wild rice. Again, that goes back to the wild rice stipulation. So now we have the rights of nature cases that also come in force. So the rights of Minoma was white earth against the state of Minnesota. So as we see what's pending, one before the tribal court with the request for rehearing of the case and before the Eighth Circuit to exhaust tribal remedies. Um, also, we have the rights of salmon in the Northwest. So again, where the federal court said you have to exhaust your tribal remedies, understand what tribal customary law is. So here's an additional component and toolbox for the tribes to implement some of that tribal customary law and those responsibilities to the resources. So when we think so, again, areas of interaction. We, again, we have EPA Clean Water Act 404 permits that we talked a little bit about. And we wanna think about land use concerns, how they impact water, because water is fundamental to what life. Water for the Ojibwe is one of that sacred space. So when we think about like, sacred lands out west, you know, like Devil's Tower or, or Bear Butte or Rainbow Bridge or these like sacred lands to the Ojibwe, the lake itself is one of those central components. So Lake Superior, you know, the tribes with the Canadian side at one point made a declaration that sacred space to the Anishinaabe is Lake Superior. Are those rivers, are the lakes in their homeland? So water's fundamentally important as part of that ecosystem and maintaining it. Um, and again, when we think of infrastructure projects, whether it be a pipeline, gas line, utility line, right of ways, any of those ideas, if there's a potential leak, pollutants, a lot of times it's gonna affect the water and be transported by water. Also, we need to understand the size and complexity of a project. So understanding how all the pieces fit together and taking time so the tribes can do an appropriate environmental review, understand the permitting process, it's important. Um, also the need for high quality data and the ability to have capacity to you know, interpret that data. So that's part of the tribal capacity infrastructure building for their regulatory capacity. When we have a specific site, maybe there's a permit. Um, so when we think about like the Enbridge pipeline, line five going through the national forest, the national forest, you know, saying, hey, we want to re-implement this permit. There's treaty rights at issue. One, how do we understand the facts and location of the species that are covered in this area? How will this affect um, the ecosystem involved? How will this area be impacted by whether or not to issue the permit? What are some of the tribal principles involved with that area, specifically in the Shawamagan Bay portion, you know, with blueberry harvest and the Mukwa Barrens? you know, why that area was significant. Um, requires applicant to also anticipate problems. So the other part is thinking about problems and how they're gonna be mitigated because typically it's difficult to mitigate a problem once it's actually happened. So to the extent that 
you can think through all the potential worst case scenarios and have a plan in place, it's really helpful. And one of the examples of that, I guess, would be um, the Edward spill at Kalamazoo. So, you know, there was the spill, they did a bunch of cleanup, and Bridge is like, oh, it's amazing, it looks beautiful again. But if you talk to the tribes locally, they're like, yeah, but there's still no wild rice growing here. There's still no traditional medicines growing here. So even though there was a spill, there was cleanup, there was attention to it, part of the traditional resources and ecosystems have still not recovered to pre-spill context. So it's really important that that site is now drastically changed and altered and that some of those traditional properties have still been affected. So that's another example to really anticipate problems before. Um, also, it's important to, to ensure that there's flexibility in the process. So if you're having a permitting process or engaging in the process, build in the flexibility to address changes, to address questions, unexpected information, and mitigate some of those potential hazards. So that's also important. Um, lastly, I guess when we think about tribal regulatory authority, so when we're specifically thinking about infrastructure projects, it's important for the tribes to be involved, for the tribes to have the capacity to have some type of regulation or regulatory authority over those projects, both over tribal lands and over treaty territories. Also, it's now with taxation. So under the new BIA right-of-way rules, the ability for tribes to tax those infrastructure components is important because it provides the resources to build capacity. Also, it's important that tribal capacity is maintained and the ability to be part of them. So if there's a request for a permit or let's say a utility line and the ability for the tribes to be partners in that and maybe like you've seen some tribes run their own utility, their broadband, starting to take over some of the grid for solar as they implement their own solar or wind energy projects and the ability to partner with, you know, the other corporations, companies to, you know, sell power, to buy power, to implement the structure, the, to implement the grid, how they make sure they're compatible with each other, to build the ability to build careers. So not only like tribal jobs, but careers as linemen and other aspects so they can maintain and fix issues and problems. So really is building the capacity, not only on the regulatory side, but also like the workers as they're implementing their own infrastructure. So that's also important. But also when we think about traditional law, understanding the sacred, so like the spiritual beings that make up the land, responsible for the land, that are also part of how we understand and regulate the land. So now I will take any questions. Nick Witch, it, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we do have several questions. Um, before I get into uh, the ones that we have, there was uh, a, a couple of people commenting about the, the maps. You had maps um, in your slides of Aboriginal territory and of traditional territory. And if you happen to know the sources of those maps just right off the top of your head, um, let us know. Otherwise, maybe we can get that information from you later after the webinar is concluded. Sure. Um, so getting into the questions, uh, the first is if tribal law conflicts with state or federal laws, which, which prevails? So that becomes complicated, right? So we talked about the Indian canons, the idea that the tribal laws, you know, things are supposed to be interpreted as the Indians understood it in favor of them. So ideally, the tribal law is going to prevail over the federal law. So then the question is, well, a, a state 
or the feds can regulate, you know, if there's a conservation necessity or public health and safety necessity. So again, part of those, and that's regulating the tribal right, right? So if a tribe's implementing saying, hey, I want to be able to harvest, but they're like, hey, public safety, and that's what the night hunt decision was all about. Tribe said, traditionally, we have the ability to harvest once the fireflies are out, which is usually mid-July, to in 24 hours a day, because like, you know, deer's eye shine, people, you know, shine historically. It's in a lot of the old archaeological reports and historical ethnological reports of being shine deer. So in the first deer decision, you know, the state said, hey, that's a safety concern. The judge, you know said yes, tribes were confined by that. Then the state started shining deer for CWD and other management purposes. And the tribes were like, well, if it's no longer a safety issue for you, then it's not a safety issue for us either. The court agreed tribes for ability to shine under the regulation. So that's an example of a potential conflict where a state law may override for if it's conservation or public health and safety. When it's the reverse, then that's still where we look at the habitat component, right? So if a state law says, hey, we're going to regulate that or that can't be prohibited or we have an obligation to issue a permit and the tribes are like, no, our law says you can't do that. You have to confine it. That's where the treaty can potentially work in the same way against the state or federal agency. And that's still being fleshed out to how strong or what that authority is, but there is some constraints on that management. So that's how we see conflict. And typically, just like in most contexts, when we see conflicts between the tribal law and the state law, it's really getting the parties to sit down, negotiate, talk, and figure it out because that's what sovereigns do. That's what governments are supposed to do, come to an agreement, come to an understanding. And also important to remember in the background is, you know, the treaty, the idea of consent, like they agreed to live according to tribal law when they said, hey, we want to reside in your territory. The tribe said, sure. You know, so to think about that too, um, all those aspects come together. Thank you. That maybe somewhat leads into our next question. Uh, the, the next question has to do, I mean, we've talked about consultation and uh, discussion and working, governments working together. Uh, we have a question about which non-tribal agencies are doing well at consultation and, and which are doing less well. And maybe, maybe limit that to the, I don't know, the geographical area that your presentation was more focused on. Yeah, I think my understanding is Right now, most to, you know, like at the federal level with Secretary Holland, you know, like at the federal level, Interior, so Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, Bureau of Indian Affairs, National Park Service, like BLM, like they're doing a really good job of con consulting, like almost some tribes are like, that's all they're doing is consulting because they're like, there's so much of it, but it's really important. So again, capacity building is really important to be able to keep up and have the bodies to go to all these consultations. My understanding um, is the states are doing a fairly good job under the current administrations, but again, the tribes specifically can, you know, correct that or maybe in some instances, but generally so. And it depends. So it depends upon, obviously, politics, who's in power, who's not. So it all depends. But sometimes the relationships, I guess, wax and wane. But thinking about, you know, the governments as sovereigns and having the importance to trust each other, believe in each other, and respect the authority of each other is important. So that way, you know, other aspects of politics or other things go to the wayside and you actually get to talk about what's best for the land or resource that 
ecosystem. So that's important to think about too. But right now, it seems to be everybody doing a fairly good job. That's that's very good to hear. Um, the next the next question is: Are tribes beneficiaries of natural resource damage assessments? And if so, how is that managed or by who? Is it the same agencies that you mentioned previously in your in your talk? Uh, EPA, Clean Water Act, those um, regulatory agencies or uh, regulations, or is it some other entity that's um, managing that? Yeah, so they they are and can be, and sometimes it becomes comp complicated based upon what resource that they're looking at potential damages. Um, so sometimes it, it depends who, whether it's the state managing maybe federal monies or federal programs, or whether it's like BLM money, EPA money, um, who's doing those cleanups. But yeah, tribes are involved. Then the question also becomes, There's a balance between harvest as being wild and harvest as being cultivated. So one of the questions came up with like wild rice, wild rice damage, and actually getting crop assistance. Then the question was, well, if the tribes start treating the wild rice as a crop that's managed, does it then become less natural and be more of a cultivated versus like natural resource? So some of those questions, you know, between what's domesticated versus natural come in. But typically, you know, they follow the rules and implement. And it, it somewhat differs and depends upon the specific species involved. Okay. Um, so the next one is for protection of traditional ecological knowledge. Many tribes decline to have areas identified in plans opting instead for notification only. Do you have suggestions for ways to effectively account for TEK during response planning while protecting those areas from abuse? So tribes have done different aspects for that. So some tribes are more open or comfortable with sharing the information. Others are less and like really kind of still private with that. So it, you have to be respectful of what the desire of the tribe is. Some entities have limited the information. So like if you look at some of the, the policies on implementing like tribal consultation with federal agencies, there's a few of the provisions that allow that information to remain private and not subject to FOIA or other Freedom of Information Act information. So there are some protections on that information. Others have held that they're just gonna keep it private. So like if a tribe shares that information, um, it's not subject to you know, dissemination. So one of the examples was they did LIDAR surveys. So I know um, USGS did light, LIDAR surveys over Wisconsin and Minnesota, and they're actually doing them out here in Montana now. And some of the tribes are like, hey, you can take this information. I want to be able to use it. You can use it in-house, but it has to be totally private. And the entity has been really open to that, that if the tribe doesn't want to share that information or have it open to the public, that it's protected. So again, it's important to build those relationships so that the trust can be built. Thank you. Um, we have a question about um, there, the question is that uh, there is a, a, a deep division in spiritual understandings between tribal and non-tribal folks. Are there limits to how co-management can work? Well, so again, you, when you think of co-management, you think of big C, little C, right? So like, are you co as an equal or co as in cooperator, you know, cooperative management? 
And so to the extent that tribes are actual co-managers as in equal managers, then they should actually have a say and the idea of consent comes in. Like if you're gonna cross their territory, use their resources, then they need to agree. Um, so that becomes a huge aspect. You also get the idea of like in the treaty cases, who's the primary manager and then that, you know, states are typically the primary managers and they're limited by the existence of the treaty right. Well, some argue based upon that idea of consent and the treaty language that it, maybe it's time to be flipped. Maybe the tribe should be the primary managers of their resources and the state, and that's limited by some of the state interests, right? Because then it would be according to tribal law, traditional law, and those cultural principles would be upheld. Either way, the idea is actually more consensual relationships and having agreement rather than adversarial relationships. Okay, and then we have a specific question about, about line five. Um, and if you could um, address tribal interests regarding line five in more detail, and uh, the person who asked the question said line five is presumably um, important for providing crude oil to the Canadian refiners, especially. Right, so line five goes across basically from Superior all the way you know, to Sault Ste. Marie, and then at some point it cuts down, and I don't know if it's still line five or if it's a different line at that point. So you get to issue at the Straits of Mackinac that's crossing the Straits, you get to issue at Bad River, you also had the permitting on Schwamm again. And part of the issue is the line's really old, right? And there's potential anomalies, there's potential needs to be replaced. So the question of permitting is where are they gonna put it? Should they keep it in the same spot? Is that appropriate? Is it not? What type of pipe are they using? How is the tribe involved? And so all those aspects. So it's not necessarily like pipeline is bad, infrastructure bad. It's how is it appropriate and going to maintain our responsibilities to the resource while potentially implementing this project. And that's where the questions come in to say, do we understand the project? Do we understand the impact on the resources? Do we understand the tribal needs? And going through those process, counting for potential worst case scenarios, you know, the ability for the tribe to tax, the ability for the tribe to regulate, then maybe some of those agreements can be implemented. It's when there's a standoff and saying, you know, you have no role in this regulatory capacity. We're just going to, you know, move forward. That's where you get the stalemate. So, again, it's important to understand the tribal role, what the tribes are asking for, how they understand that information to make sure their resources are protected and they're upholding their treaty responsibilities, right? If the tribes have a under the first treaty with creation to say, hey, we have responsibilities to protect these resources, our lands. They have to uphold that. So if a project can be implemented in a way that successfully maintains that ecosystem, that's one thing. If it can't, then that, that's where the conflict comes in. Again, thank you so much, um, Professor Stark, for uh, being so generous with your, with your time today and for um, such an insightful presentation. Um, and thanks everybody who's who's participating and hope you'll join us in August for the next installment of our summer webinar series. Um, again, more information on that soon. And um, I have a couple of questions still in the Q and A box, Professor Stark. I'm gonna I'm going to send those to you in email, and um, as you have time, maybe you can answer and and we'll get that information to the individuals who asked them. Um, so thank you all, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah.